Hi everyone, I'm Tom and this is going to be my top games of all time. I've been meaning to do this for a few years now and I have finally, you know, calculated and agonised enough to the point where I'm not entirely happy about it. I think I could just tweak games by a couple of positions forever. But yeah, I decided that it has to stop somewhere and yeah, this is just going to be it. Although maybe I'll be back here in a week's time with a completely different top list. So this is going to be my, it was originally just going to be a top 10 and then I thought I'm leaving off too many brilliant games. So it's going to be a top 50 split into different parts. If you're just interested in the top 10, wait until uh, Monday when that one drops and you can just see those ones. But yeah, at the, but even doing 50, I thought... Oh, I'm leaving off too many games, maybe I should do 100. But at that point, you might as well just list every single game. Although, yeah, there's not time for that. Let's just do 50 of them. So, yeah, a bit about if you are new to the channel, welcome. There's hundreds of th playthroughs on here. Watch some of them. But uh, I generally play two players, not exclusively, but mainly play two players. We don't like uh, fighting, stealing, take that between each other in them at all. And I am definitely... Not exclusively, but my heart belongs to uh, Euro games and economic simulations and things. And you can see examples of some of these games behind me of some of our favourites. Because if we've kept it, it's probably a game we really enjoy. And you're probably going to be seeing a lot of these come up in this top 50. But enough preamble. So let's get started with number 50, Queen's Architect from designer Volker Schakatel. Pronunciation, I do apologise. This is a race game of trying to build in cities for the queen. You can see on the back of the box there, we are trying to recruit the right craftsmen. You know, there are you know bricklayers and carpenters and all sorts of different types that are these hexagons with different values on them. And as you recruit them, they come into your display and the number they're pointing at is how is their effectiveness, how well they can build. And different cities around the board need different values to construct in. And so you need to get the right configuration because each city needs a different configuration of uh, craftsmen. And they need to have a high enough value to build in there. And you are trying to build in enough cities to progress up this prestige track that is different every game. The values in it are different every time to be able to jump from step to step. You are trying to do these increasingly more difficult builds to rush up this track and then get to the middle and build in the capital to win the game. One of the main things about it though as well is that these hexagons have different values all around the outside because when you do a build and you hopefully progress up that prestige track, you rotate all of your craftsmen. So now they have completely different values. Maybe some drop off, you know, some are like, five zero five zero five zero so every other build is going to be terrible for them and then they're going to be great again some are you know some start out you know five four three two one some start out terrible and get better as they go along so you need to balance these different uh, these different skill levels to try and get what you need and get the most effective actions really because as I mentioned this is a race game and as such Rachel who's my girlfriend I play most of my games with she tends to win race games and yeah it's I think that some games I definitely have a fonder spot for just because of how much that she loves them as well but I definitely love Queen's Architect a lot and I think it's one that doesn't get as much attention I can't really blame people can you there's so many games to talk about but yeah I think Queen's Architect is maybe a forgotten one that definitely deserves a look. Queen's Architect. Number 49 is Agents of Smirch, designed by Jason Maxwell. This is a cooperative storytelling game in the sense that it's got a great big storybook in it. And this is a, you know, a parody James Bond kind of story. We are all different secret agents and we are trying to defeat various henchmen and find intel to eventually locate and take down Dr. Lobo each time. Now you might have heard of Tales of the Arabian Nights, which is, you know, the 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 original, the great big storybook game that uh, is maybe more familiar to people, but we found that yeah, that it's a, it's a great idea. I love the storybook concept, but that being a competitive game yeah, you have to get rid of any kind of competition in it because, yeah, it's it's just basically go with the story because every time we've played it, I think it has gone abysmally for one person who has 
pretty much had no fun and not gotten to play anything. And then everybody else has to, you know, just... You have to enjoy their misfortune, I guess. This being a cooperative game, none of that matters. And yeah, the the it's it's got a bit of a weakness in the end game in it that it's it's fairly random whether you win or lose the final thing. There is uh, there's some expansions to this. There's an expansion that takes you to Australia as well as the the you know, the rest of the world. And there is a, a a little book expansion called Showdown that adds you know a campaign to this that uh, changes some of the rules as you go on and changes the end game up to make it a lot better. I'm not sure how widely available that is, but I love the yeah, I love the silly theme of it, the the you know taking the mick out of the various tropes that you'll be familiar with from these various spy stories. I love that we're adventuring through the globe that we are getting these skill tokens and yeah, a lot of it comes down to you know rolling dice as to whether you pass these checks or not, which if you see my videos, I'm not usually a fan of, but if you've got the skill token, you pass it immediately. I just think that it's it being a cooperative game, if things are all going wrong and you are getting terrible uh, dice rolls and things, at least we're all in it together. And it's not just like uh, you are losing the game because of that. I think that it's the the story that it tells each time is, you know, it's still the, the same theme of we are secret agents and we are going around the world to chase down this guy. But it goes very differently. It comes with a huge story because I mentioned the expansion comes with a separate one as well. And it's never been anything less than a, an amazingly fun time always. And I I really wish that there were you know, nothing against Agents of Smush. I really wish that this would, you know, this would spawn more games based on it, not just from 8th Summit, you know, hopefully they've got something in the works for more of this or another storybook game, but more companies. I, I imagine that they don't do it because it's loads and loads of work to get, you know, this huge... Uh, not necessarily choose your own adventure, but to get the number of entries you need in the book to have a wide variety in the game so that it's, it's going to play out very differently each time. I imagine that's a lot of work, but I would love to see more storybook games like this from other people. But for now, it's number 49, Agents of Smush. Number 48, Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. This is a, a mashup game, really, between between two cities and the castles of Mad King Ludwig. And it's basically a drafting game. You have a hand of tiles that represent different rooms in these castles that we're going to be building. And we're going to be passing them, we're going to be picking one and passing them back and forth to try and build up the best castles. And, you know, certain rooms will get more points if they're adjacent to other rooms, certain rooms will depend on the column that they're in. You know, this is going to score you a point for every utility room you've got in this column. It's got the the kind of spatial planning and the different scoring elements that were present in Between Two Cities, which is a fantastic game in its own right, a bit of a lighter game as well, maybe a better introduction than this one is. But it combines that with the kind of the the crazy theme and the more unique scoring than uh, between two cities that comes from the castles of mad king ludwig uh, special point scoring cards that you can draw as well throughout uh, the game to get you extra points at the end it does come down to yeah I, I love the extra options that come from having the castles part in it and i absolutely love the theme as well and What's a great thing as well to have uh, these, I'm, I'm sure there's more that I haven't come across, but I really like the the, the mashup style of it as well, that um, you know, a great game from Bezier and a great game from Stonemaier can come together and result in something great in its own right as well. I've done a playthrough for this one. This is the first one I've done a playthrough for. I've tried the other two. People don't vote for them. One day, though, we'll do a playthrough for those. So 48, Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Number 47 is Wingspan, which is, yeah, surely at the forefront of a lot of people's minds lately for the last few months. You can get hold of it now. And yeah, it's, it's tempting to put this at number one just to annoy certain people. Can you imagine people would be annoyed by that? I can't. It's a beautiful game about birds and not putting them in an aviary, bird watching and trying to see the best birds, really. It's... Designed by Elizabeth Hargrave, who is a, a bird boffin, and it's full of facts about the various birds in the game. But let's talk about the game itself. This is a tableau building game where each of us has a menu uh, that we are going to put different birds in. So some that live in a forest, some that live on water. 
and each of these rows activates different things. So you can you get a certain number of cubes per round to perform actions with, and some will be getting new bird cards, some will be your birds laying eggs, some will be you getting resources, and then the other action is you actually putting birds out there. And the birds go in certain rows, and when you activate it, so say I want to get some new bird cards, I get some new bird cards, depending on how many birds I've put out there, I get more and more as I fill up that row, but also, after I've done that, we then go back through the row and every bird that I've placed there has some kind of special ability on it that will trigger now. And some abilities won't trigger then, they will trigger when another player does something, or maybe I am shooting for, you know, goals at the end of each round, or I have secret goals for the end of the game. It is a really beautiful... Uh, engine building game really it's uh it's very accessible very very beautiful you know crazy high production values it's got a great little solo mode in there from Automa factory who generally work with stonemaier games and do amazing solo things i did a full playthrough of this so you can check it check it out if you're unfamiliar with it but yeah between the beautiful gameplay and the unusual theme, unusual to me anyway, and the beautiful artwork. I absolutely love Wingspan and I'd encourage you to check it out. Number 47. Number 46, the game shrunk. This is SOS Titanic. And I can easily understand that uh, if you're familiar with the game, people might say, well, isn't this just solitaire? Isn't this just patience? You know, the, the card game that's on your, your computer? And yes, it kind of is, but it's 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 more than just uh, than just solitaire. So maybe it's uh, the sheer amount of time that I imagine, like many of you, have played uh, solitaire. Maybe it is the theming as well. I definitely was at a certain point in my childhood, very obsessed with the Titanic, and probably some of that is still bleeding out into my board game fandom as well. So it's the combination of those things, and it's not just solitaire. You are playing as different characters as a cooperative game. So it's cooperative solitaire. For a start, that's different. And the rows, instead of you know just being decks of cards, are different classes of passengers that you need to get into the lifeboats. You are trying to save as many people as possible from the Titanic. How's about that for a theme? And as well, I'm actually going to open the box. As well, the, the rows of passengers go underneath this book here. So you can see at the start, the Titanic's doing okay. And we've got quite a few rows of passengers here. And as the game progresses, we see time pass and the Titanic start to sink more and more. And these decks of passengers start to you know, flood and the passengers have to run up the boat to try and get to safety. And then you have to shuffle your stacks together. So the work that you've done, arranging them ready to go in the lifeboat is undone and everything shuffled up again in the chaos of it. And you know, eventually if you turn too many pages and get too many things wrong, then it's game over. But the sooner you can do it, the more points that you'll get for trying to save them. And it's, uh, it, says, yeah, it says on the front of the rule book, the historical crew would have scored 19 points how would you have scored? And so I love, as I mentioned, yeah, it is solitaire with, uh, with it's solitaire with special player powers and you can play it cooperatively. But I think that the theme and the way it all ties in with the theme, not just for it having this storybook, but for, for those things that I described, the, the thematic elements of trying to get these people onto the lifeboats, of how the stacks all shuffle when the boat starts to get flooded, of the powers and the people themselves are the crew of the Titanic as well. I think it comes together absolutely beautifully. The downside of this is, I you know, things change and you know where the availability of things is going to change all the time. But for the six or so years that I've been playing board games, this has been out of out of print the entire time. This is a second-hand copy. I was lucky to get off the geek market, I think. So yeah, keep an eye if you are interested in this. And unfortunately, it's out of print still. Uh, keep an eye on the geek market or eBay or something. It does tend to get a higher price now because, yeah, that's the way things work. The longer it's out of print, the more scarce it is, the higher it's going to cost. But hopefully, Ludonaut, Ludonaut are the publisher, get in gear, this is amazing. More people should be able to play this. There's definitely, I. there's a few people that I would love to have bought a copy for to get them to play the game. I think they would love it, but I can't do that. So yeah, get it in print, Ludonaut, get it sorted. SOS Titanic.
Back to games that I do have playthroughs for, this is At the Gates of Lo Yang, designed by Uwe Rosenberg. I forgot to say the designers for those games, didn't I? Anyway, uh, this is a game all about growing vegetables, basically. We are, does the back of the box, the back of SOS Titanic told me nothing to be able to show you, but we are filling up cards that are fields. It's an awfully noisy box, I do apologize. Uh, we are building up fields with vegetables. You, know, you plant one vegetable, you get a load from the supply. And we are trying to, we, we draft cards from this central display. You end up with a hand of cards and each turn, one of us has to either take a card from our hand and a card from the middle, or we need to put another card out in the middle. It's got a really great, that's a, that's a really great card selection system because yeah, you are trying to wait out the other player, hoping that they have a card out for you. Or you, know, you can't just take two great cards you have in your hand. You have to risk it and put it out in the middle so that you can take one from your hand and one from the display as well. And between those cards are, you know, more fields to put things out in. Traders where you can swap vegetables for other ones that you need more. Uh, special player powers that you can get, but mainly customers. Yeah, one-off customers or regular customers. And you need to make it so that the vegetables you're planting are the right ones for the customers that you have managed to get during this draft there's nothing else really like it i think in terms of the card play in terms of the vegetables and things there is a newer uwe rosenberg game called uh Reichholt, which uses a similar a, a similar thing of planting the vegetables it's different in some other ways it's uh it's a worker placement game rather than using this uh, card system uh, and it uses a bit of a similar way of uh, of scoring but it's different in here here there is a points track and at the end of your turn, you can spend one coin to move one up the points track. But each one after that is the value that is on the space that you're moving to. So, yeah, it's uh, it's really adds an extra layer of thought into how much you are willing to spend because you want to keep that money for future rounds to be able to afford the vegetables and all of this stuff. But at the same time, you don't want to fall behind. You want to progress up those early ones while they're cheap because it's going to cost you a fortune later on in the game. There is a playthrough for this that you can check out, though, at the gates of Lo Yang. Number 44 is Foothills from Ben Bateson and Tony Boydell. Probably, I think definitely, the newest game in this. We only got this, got this at the expo, you know, a, a week or so ago. And so, yeah, this is kind of, it was a bit of contention for me. Do I put it in? We've only played it a couple of times. Do I put it in already? And then I thought, you know, this is a snapshot of the games that I, the, the games that I like in the order that I like them of this point in time. So yes, it could go up more than this. This is a two player Snowdonia experience. So Snowdonia is a, a, a worker placement train game. This is a two player only reimagining of it really. Instead of just building one big railway line, there are six railway lines that you can kind of see on the back of the box there. And instead of placing workers, we have a display in front of us that's got the same actions as Snowdonia, but they're cards instead. And they relate to, you know, clearing rubble, building, uh, laying track, converting resources, building stations, you know, similar things. But when you have performed your action, you flip over the card and it's got a kind of a kind of weaker or maybe you'd say more specialized side that uh, maybe it's like you you can build a station but you don't get the bonus from building that station and to be able to access the other side of it it's not the same action as well it's you know each action is paired with a different action so getting resources might have the clearing rubble on the other side it doesn't but i can't quite remember which one is cut on the other side of it so you are looking for the right combination, the right time to flip these things over because inevitably you end up that's, oh, it's, a, it's the perfect time for me to clear rubble right now, but I've got it on the other side. And, I, and if I do this other action, sure, I'll get access to it next time, but will my opponent clear that rubble first and it will have just been a waste of my time. A huge part of this game, because it is a two-player game, and when we, we played this, no, we saw this being played at the Expo last year, in its demo form and the focus of it is you know because it's a two-player game it's not you know confrontational and aggressive but it is very involved and you need to be aware of what the other person is doing it's very opportunistic in that if i clear rubble out i've now made it available for you to lay track or build a station there so 
you know, you have to be completely aware of what I'm what I've done or what I am going for so that you can be ready to snoop it to swoop in when I have opened up opportunities for you. And I think that is the real key to it because you know, it, it's got some other great elements that, like you're putting, uh, you're you're changing the cards that are available to you as well, so you can get uh, abilities that are more suited to what you are going for at the time. But also, so you can put cards in your scoring pile, so you can get cards for the number of passengers that you've got, number of stations that you've built, that kind of thing. You know, tailor it to the way that you have played the game. But yeah, the how much you need to be involved in every second of what's happening in the game really just really makes it pop it's got beautiful clemens friends artwork as at the gates of low yang did and yeah i, I love snowdonia as well and being a mainly two-player gamer oh, it's beautiful but yeah playthrough will come from this soon i think <laughs> this is uh yeah i'll I will extrapolate. I will be more verbose in a proper first impressions for it. But hey, that's Foothills. Number 43 is Suburbia. This is a city building game where we are buying from a display to get various tiles, you know, industrial, residential or commercial that all have different powers, different point scoring opportunities. And we are trying to configure our cities to, you know, <laughs> to get the best combos between these things, the best synergy between all of these various elements in it. It's got, you know, I can't remember how many expansions it's got now. It's got expansions that make really nice additions to it as well in that, you know, this is just the base game box, but uh, there are expansions that add these water strips to it that can potentially give you a load of points and yeah, you know, points for doing other things as well, but they limit how you can build as well. And there is a five-star expansion where there is a turn order and you can get real benefits for building certain tiles that have got stars on them as well. But the main thing is, like in most tile lane games, the not just the the picture, the the look of the city that you end up building. And you know, it usually ends up in some crazy configuration because of the path that you ended up taking. But also the story that you end up telling as well, that you know, you will get punished for it, but inevitably you will end up putting residential next to industrial. So you'll end up with this uh, this great big housing complex next to this garbage dump and things. All sorts of stuff like that that just emerges from the game just in the way that you have been you know, probably doing something for a mechanical reason, but then you can sit back and look at it at the end and see this uh, this wacky story that your city has ended up telling. It's brilliant. Suburbia. Playthrough coming for that soon, I think. Number 42 is Flatline from probably real-time master Kane Klenko. This is a real-time dice game where we are... On a spaceship, we've had some issues with bombs and things in previous uh, games, but now we need to tend to the injured. And there are all these medical bays in the game where they need a certain configuration of dice to be spent. This is a real-time game with very short rounds, and between us, we need to decide what we are doing with our dice in this, which patients we are going to try and save, because the you know the aim of the game is to cure a certain number of patients based on the difficulty that you're playing. Are you going to be swapping your dice around? You need to these cards will come out that will be emergencies, and if too many come out, you will lose, so you need to spend your dice on that as well. But in doing so, you will get special abilities from it. So it's all about the delicate balance of doing all of this stuff under the ever-present, uh, ever more pressurized feeling of you know, your time constraint, that every second you spend discussing what you're gonna do, once the round starts, of course, is less time you've got to actually do it. And yeah, there's there's nothing to be done once that buzzer sounds. It's the start of, I'm not sure how many are gonna be uh, in this, uh, this top 50 series. It's the start of uh, my love for real-time games. Well, not the first one, but the start in this top 50, I think. I absolutely love them. And yeah, there's, uh, there's a few in there, like maybe Galaxy Trucker that does it uh, competitively, but add, mixing in my love for cart games as well. Flatline is just absolutely beautiful, and I haven't played it yet, but Ken Klenko is the designer of the new Pandemic Rapid Response, which uh, I hear is like this, so really looking forward to that if that's the case. But here, we're talking about Flatline. It's on the list. There you go. And finally for this part, number 41 is Teotihuacan City of Gods. This is a 
a rondelle game really where we have you can see a representation of it on the back of the box there we have this great big board with all of these different action spaces on them and we have three workers and each turn you'll take one of those workers and move them a certain number of spaces restricting what you can do but the idea of the game is to group these workers up because you'll get more powerful actions and we're doing all sorts one of the main things is building this great big temple of tiles in the middle we're trying to progress up certain worship tracks and stuff as well and gain resources gain powers it's a lot of classic Euro stuff from designer Danielle Tashini, who you know co-designed things like Zolkin, the Mayan calendar. I think there are so many elements of this that come together so beautifully. Just that core thing, which is seen in other games like uh, Versailles, is a good uh, Rondell game that I think is the inspiration for uh, the way it works in here. It's got so much variability in it as well. You know, the 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 actual action spaces on the board. Uh, come at separate tiles to juggle them around the bonuses you will get for all of the different temples and things pretty much everything is customizable in this for you know not a completely different experience you're still playing the game but uh, yeah so much of it changes that that is kind of one of the things that I really really love about the the particular Euro games that I like being presented with this particular different situation each time and seeing okay then trying to link the few things together. What am I going to go for this game? Okay, this is out. There's a bonus for doing this. This will help me get up this temple. Oh, and that temple's got this bonus on it, so I'll do this. Yeah, it works together beautifully, and it's coming out with that expansion that I'm a bit worried about uh, turning on more modules from it because it's definitely uh, on the medium-heavy side of uh, the weight of things. But yeah, I, I just look forward to more excuses to play it again. And I did a full playthrough for this last year as well. So that is on its side, Teotihuacan. And that is the first 10. So there are four more parts to this. We're only at number 41. We've got to go all the way to the top of the most of the poppermost. And yeah, I will see you tomorrow for part two of this five part thing. This is all leading up to, by the way, on Monday, the launch of my Patreon campaign. For the very first time, I am making the switch from Kickstarter to Patreon. Yeah, it's only going to not apply for a few days, but for the rest of time, there will be a Patreon campaign there linked in the description and in the corner. If you like what I do, if you are brand new and you love this especially, but if you like the playthroughs and things that I do, all the various, you know, top tens and Q and A's and going to conventions and things, if you would like me to carry on being able to make all of this stuff for you, then your support is genuinely essential. Without the other Kickstarters, it couldn't have happened. And so I would love your support if you can, in the Patreon campaign. You can head over to the links and have a look at it and see if you're interested. Either way, though, I'm still going to see you tomorrow for 10 more games. See you there. Bye, everyone.